Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Briz Science, proudly presented by the University of Queensland. I'm your MC for this evening, Joel Gilmore. Um, we are, of course, hosted here at the wonderful State Library of Queensland at The Edge, our wonderful venue's partners. And I'd like to take this opportunity to res respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight and to pay my respect to elders, both past and present. I also want to recognise those whose ongoing efforts to protect and promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture will leave a lasting legacy for elders all the way into the future. Tonight, we have a very exciting talk for you. A little bit of housekeeping first. If this is your first Briz Science, welcome. We are a free public lecture series that runs once a month on a Monday night, where we bring not just the best scientists, but also the best communicators to share their research and their passion with you. We do a couple of things a little bit different here. Firstly is, if you have a mobile phone, you can now switch it on, but also on silent. And um, we will be live tweeting throughout the evening with the hashtag BrizScience. That's also how you can ask questions of the speaker. So at the end of the talk, we will take questions over Twitter, or you might have received a question slip on your way in, a piece of paper. You can write down your question, staple it to a $20 note, and um, we will come round and collect those, and um, we'll get to as many of those questions as we can at the end of the talk. Finally, we do have some food and drink afterwards, and we'd love you to join us to um, have a chat with our speaker and amongst yourselves, and hopefully celebrate all the wonderful science that's happening around Brisbane at the moment. So for tonight's talk, we are talking music, but not just any music. We are turning our back on Nickelback, and we are going under the sea, not for a singing crab, Thank you to the one Disney person in the audience. That's great. Thank you for coming. Um, but for the true masters of song, whales. That's right. Believe it or not, humpback whales can really wail on the low notes. Thank you. And even carry a tuna. Third time lucky. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Yes, and male, groups of male whales have even been found to sing the same song, although this song changes and evolves over time, unlike an Ed Sheeran song. So, and I lost them. <laughs> so tonight, to find out what makes a hit song and how this comes together, we are very lucky to have with us Dr. Jenny Allen, who is an adjunct research fellow at the University of Queensland and also a Griffith University marine science lecturer. And Jenny studies the culture and learning in humpback whales, and tonight is going to give us an insight into the process of creating and learning whale songs. So to, for a talk which I guarantee will be a whale of a time, please put your hands together and welcome Dr. Jenny Allen. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Jenny, and um, just a nod at your Disney, this is a Little Mermaid dress. <laughs> um, so I'm Jenny, I'm gonna be talking to you today about what exactly makes a whale song catchy. Uh, a little bit of background on me, just in case you're wondering who this crazy lady standing up here talking to you is. Uh, you can probably tell by my accent that I am not from Australia. I am originally from Boston in the US, uh, and I have bounced around kind of all over the world for my work. I did my undergraduate in Miami. I did my master's degree in Scotland. I did some work back in Boston and in Alaska, and then I ended up here where I did my PhD at the University of Queensland uh, with the Cetacean Ecology and Acoustics Laboratory, which is run by Michael Node and Rebecca Dunlop. So my background is in humpback whale behavior. So I'm really interested in what types of behavior they do and how they learn that behavior. Currently, my research is focused on cetacean culture. And I know it sounds weird to think of animals having culture, but uh, I promise I will get to that later on. So it sounds a little weird now, but stick with me. Uh, and in particular, I look at social learning in humpback whales. So what does that mean? Well, there are two types of learning in general, asocial learning and social learning. Asocial learning is something like trial and error. You're attempting to learn something by yourself. 
Social learning is where you learn from somebody else. Um, oh, I have some, I had some slides there, but okay, so I will just talk about it. Um, so if you imagine that you have a group of people and some of them do a particular kind of behavior. In asocial learning, who does that behavior really has nothing to do with who spends time with whom. But in social learning, um, who does that behavior has to do with who spends time together. So you probably have some people that you spend a lot of time with, your partner, your children, your coworkers that you see every day, your best friends. Then you might have people that you don't really see that often, such as your tax accountant or the person who bags your groceries at Woolies. Those are people that you are acquainted with, but you're not gonna have a strong association with. And that's what we're talking about with social learning. We're talking about uh, when behaviors are learned based on who you spend the most time with. Now, there are three types of social learning. Uh, we're really only gonna focus on one for this talk, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of background. You have vertical learning, which is parent to child. You have oblique, which is uh, from a non-parent of a previous generation, so maybe an aunt or an uncle or a teacher. Um, that's oblique. And then horizontal, which is between peers um, of the same generation. So arguably, this is horizontal learning right now. And that's what we're gonna be focusing on. That's what humpback whales do. They do horizontal learning. So when you hear me use that term, that's what that means. So now what do we mean by culture in animals? Um, there's a wide variety of definitions, and for a long time, it was very anthropocentric. So it was thought that only humans could have culture. But in the past maybe 20 years or so, we've really started to broaden the definition and make it more inclusive, and as a result, we've started to see aspects of culture in a lot of different animal species. So no matter how you define culture in terms of animals, they always have these couple of things in common. The first is that if something is cultural, it's learned, it's not innate, you're not born with it. You have to learn it somehow. The second aspect is that it's socially learned. So the idea that it's learned from individuals that you spend a lot of time with. In particular, it's driven by social interactions. So you're going to learn from the individuals you spend more time with. You're more likely to pick up a habit from your partner than from your tax accountant. And finally, it's a behavior that's done similarly by multiple individuals. So a really good example is in the states where I'm from, when people eat, they have the fork in their left hand, knife in their right hand. They cut, and then they put the fork, the knife down, they switch, the fork to the right hand and eat. And I know it's inefficient, but it's just, it's how we do it. It's how I always ate my food. And then I moved to Scotland and I noticed that everybody had the fork in the left, knife in the right, would cut and then just eat with the left. So that's a cultural difference. It's very distinct between North America and Europe, but everybody does it the same way. And you're probably gonna do whatever your parents do or whatever the people around you do. There are a lot of different, they were unprepared for how loud my voice is. Um, so there are a lot of different examples of culture in animals. The best example and the most widely known example is bird song. So male birds will learn their song from other males, usually older males, in their population or in their group. Um, sometimes you get problem solving. So in this upper right hand corner we have a lemur solving a puzzle box and the ability to solve it and how they choose to solve it we found is socially learned. You can also find it in things like um, bumblebees. So this is one of my favorite examples because it's really recent and um, it's so unexpected. So in bumblebees because insect biologists get to perform controlled experiments, which I'm really jealous of because I can't do that with my whales. So what they found was that if they taught certain bees to twist a string that had sugar water at the end, they could get access to the sugar water by twisting the string. 
And then they put in bees that they hadn't trained. And they found that if the bee spent time around a bee that they'd trained, the bee would pick up the, the behavior. And they found that not only was this being socially learned by um, all the bees, it was happening across multiple generations. So it was persisting. So they trained a few, and then the behavior spread all on its own. One of the first examples of culture in animals was in Japanese macaques, which is this monkey here holding a sweet potato. And this was back in 1953, I think. Um, and what they did was the scientists taught a few of the sweet potatoes, or a few of the monkeys, to um, wash the sand off of the sweet potatoes. And then they sat back and watched what happened. And lo and behold, individuals who saw a monkey washing the sand off the sweet potato would start to do that themselves, and it spread very quickly. And then finally, in humpback whales, you get social learning in song, which I'll spend the rest of this talk on, but you also get it in feeding behaviors. So what I did my master's on was I found that over about 30 year period, there was a particular type of feeding behavior that spread through the population in the Gulf of Maine, which is in the North Atlantic, through association. So whales that spent time together were more likely to do the same feeding behavior. So humpback whale song is one of the best examples we have of culture in an animal species. And so I'm gonna run you through some of the basics of humpback whale song in case you're not familiar with it. So humpback whale songs are only sung by the males. You don't, you don't get females singing. Females will make different sounds, but they just won't sing. You have population-wide conformity. That means that all the males in a single population, they're singing the same song pattern at any one time. So if you go scuba diving um, off the coast here while the whales are migrating, if you went on 10 different days, you'd probably hear 10 different whales, but it's the same song. You'd recognize it eventually. That song, however, is always changing. But even though it's constantly changing, all the individual males are able to pick up those changes so that even as it's changing, they're still all singing the same song at any one time. And we're not sure what the function of the song is, but because males sing it, and they predominantly sing on the migration to and from the breeding ground as well as at the breeding ground, we're pretty sure that it's reproductive, but we're not sure if they're singing to impress the ladies to intimidate the other guys or some combination of the two. But there are a few aspects of humpback whale song that make it a really good non-human model of cultural learning or social learning. Um, and particularly it's exciting because it's a non-primate example because uh, before humpback whales, most of the examples of culture that we had were primates. Um, and it's a very comparable system to the cultural system we have in humans. And there are a few reasons for this. The first is that the song is very complex. So I'll play you a little bit of it um, in a minute, but it's a very complicated pattern. It's both adaptive and stable, because as I said, all the males are conforming to the same song, but that song is always changing. So you get this balance of um, variability and um, stability you get a very rapid spread of the behavior. So these males are learning essentially a new song every single year. And it, they're learning it in a matter of weeks. Um, so it's spreading very, very fast through the population. And it's spreading on a huge spatial scale. So the population of East Australia um, stretches hundreds of kilometers, um, even thousands of kilometers if you factor in the migration and it spreads through that entire population on that huge spatial scale. And actually in the South Pacific, we get song patterns that will move from West Australia to East Australia, to New Caledonia, to Tonga, to French Polynesia. And that's over a few years, but you get one pattern that essentially goes from West Australia to French Polynesia. And that kind of spatial scale we really only see that in humans, apart from this example, and that's one of the reasons why it makes such a good model. Now, to give you a brief idea of how um, the song is structured, because it's actually very different from bird song, it's what's called um, a hierarchical structure. And that means that um, it has 
different layers that are each built on top of each other. So the most basic layer are the sound units, and that's the equivalent to words. So those are the individual sounds that the whales are making. Those sounds or sound units will be arranged in a pattern, and we call that pattern a phrase. So that's the line of the song. You have words, you arrange those words in a pattern, and you get a line. They repeat that phrase over and over and over again. And all of the repetitions of that phrase are a theme. So that's kind of the equivalent of the verse of the song. You have a line that gets repeated a few times, and then they move on to the next line, and they repeat that a few times. And they'll usually sing four to seven different themes, and then once they've sung all of those themes, that's the song or song cycle. And then they'll go back to the beginning and they'll start the whole thing all over again. So that's what we mean by a hierarchical structure. So this is an example of humpback whale song. So on the bottom axis, you have time. And on the Y axis, you have frequency or pitch. So um, things that are closer to the bottom are going to be the low sounds, and sounds that are higher up on there are going to be the high sounds. So this is one phrase of a humpback whale song. So you have the low notes at the start. Beautiful, isn't it? Four years of my life listening to this over and over and over. Um, so that's an example um, of a phrase. And each of those sounds are units. And they'll repeat this over and over again, not always the exact same way. You know, here there are, um, what, seven of these low units at the start. And maybe the next time they repeat it, they'll only do six, or maybe they'll do eight. But it's the same pattern, and they'll just repeat that over and over again. Now, I mentioned that humpback whale song changes, and it changes in two very distinct ways. The first is evolutionary change, and the second is revolutionary change. So evolutionary changes are very slow. They're very progressive. Um, and you can usually recognize um, the link between the two. So here you can see, oh, right, I have a laser pointer. Um, you can see here, it's gone from AB to ABB. So that's a very small change, and you can recognize the relationship between them. But every so often, we'll get what's called a cultural revolution, and that's where we have a very quick and radical change. They essentially take the entire song, throw it out, bring in a brand new one that bears no resemblance to the one that it replaced. So that's what you can see here, it goes from AB to XXY. So it's very, very clear that this is an entirely new pattern. So when I wanted to ask this question of how whales learn their songs and what aspects of the song make it easy to learn, what, what do they decide to pick up, what do they not pick up, uh, I wanted to do this by looking at the song on a very fine scale. That means examining the song at individual um, sound unit level. So what I had to do is I had to transcribe all of these song patterns. So if you think about that example that I showed you, I would take that and change it into an alphanumeric string. So I would give each of those sound units uh, a letter or a number. And then I'd write out the song pattern like this. So that I have a string of letters and numbers that represent the song pattern. And then I can start analyzing those patterns. So what was I looking for? I was mainly looking for patterns that all of these songs had in common. So patterns over time. What, what types of um, changes am I seeing? And what types of patterns do I see in very different songs? Um, ultimately, what I was looking for is what were the rules? What were the rules that these songs had to follow? Were there any rules at all? Um, and if so, what were they? So that's what I was looking for. All of this data was collected in East Australia from 2002 to 2014. And it's predominantly collected on uh, Pridgeen, or off Pridgeen Beach, which is on the Sunshine Coast. 
So this is uh, the field site where most of the data was collected. And we used a lot of different recording platforms. So here we had um, what's called a hydrophone array. So each of those was an underwater microphone called a hydrophone. And so as the whales swum past, we could, um, we could pick it up and actually even tell where they were. Other times we just put one recorder in the water. We'd drop it in, come back three months later, pick it up, it'd be full of whale song. Sometimes we'd go out in a boat and when we found a whale, we'd drop in the recorder. If the whale was singing, we'd make recording there. So for my data, I wanted to use, uh, I used 36 song cycles from each year. So a song cycle, remember I talked about the structure of the song. And so once they sing those four or five different themes in a row and they go back to the start, that's the start of a new song cycle. So I used 36 song cycles in each year and I made sure that I had at least six different whales because I wanted to make sure that I was accounting for variability between the different singers. So I wanted to look at a few key song features. And those three features that I ended up looking at were complexity, entropy, and individuality. Now I'm not gonna go into how I calculated each of these things because it's very mathy, but if you want to know more about how I actually calculated these different things and measured them, um, then I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. But the first feature was complexity. So this is how complicated is the pattern? How many different sound units are there? How many sound units are there in total? How many different themes? How long are those themes? So I took aspects like that and I um, was able to come up with one unit of complexity that took all of these things into account. The second measure was entropy. Entropy is essentially how predictable is a pattern. And uh, by extension, how much information does it maybe contain? So if something is very predictable, then it probably doesn't contain a lot of information because it's very predictable to, um, if you hear A, you know that B is probably going to follow. But if something is very unpredictable, there are two options. One, it could be random, or two, it could contain a lot of different information. So that's why I wanted to measure entropy. I wanted to get an idea of how predictable these patterns were and how much information they might contain. And then finally, I wanted to look at individuality. And this is how unique is the pattern. So I mentioned that everybody is singing the same song at the same time, but they're not identical. They're not carbon copies of each other. They're the same song pattern the way that um, when I cover ACDC's Thunderstruck at karaoke, technically we're singing the exact same pattern, but it's not the same, and we all know that. So that's what we mean by, by how unique is it. Are they singing everything the exact same way, or are some of them ACDC and some of them are me at karaoke? So I did this by looking at shared and unique variants of the song. So was this version of the song only ever sung by one male, or was it sung by at least two different males? And all of these features, I had to keep in mind that hierarchical structure. So I had to make sure that I was accounting for the fact that there's the theme level, all these different themes that are arranged a certain way, and then the song level, the complete song, all the different sounds all together. So this is what I found. So this is my measure of complexity. And because I had to account for those different levels of the hierarchical structure, that's why there are a couple of different lines. So I have, I measured complexity at the song level, the theme level, and then I combine them all. So here we have years, and this is the measure of complexity. That's very mathy that you can ask about later. And at first, it looks like there isn't really a clear pattern happening here. But when you take into account whether songs were changing via those small evolutions or those big radical revolutions, then a pretty clear pattern emerged. What I found was that as the song was evolving through those progressive changes, it was getting more and more complicated. And then when a revolution happened, when they threw out the entire new old song, brought in a brand new one, the complexity was decreasing. So the new song was always simpler than the one it replaced. And I found this over the course of the whole study period. That's why it has this nice oscillating pattern to it. 
Um, and so that was really exciting for us to find. Then I looked at entropy. And again, I had to look at how predictable the pattern was in terms of the units and also in terms of the themes. So that's why there's two lines here. So again, you have years here, and this is measure of, of entropy. And here, higher, it's, it's a little backwards. Higher numbers here mean less predictability. So if something has low entropy, it means it's very, very predictable. And same thing with the complexity. At first glance, it looks like there's no real clear pattern. It looks a bit all over the shop. But when you account for whether or not changes were evolutions or revolutions, still no pattern, nothing's happening. So what this told me was that entropy and complexity didn't really have anything to do with each other, which really surprised me. I thought that a more complicated song would be less predictable, but that's not what I found at all. Complexity really had nothing to do with how predictable a song was. So that was really unexpected. And then we looked at individuality. So here you'll notice I have a whole rainbow of colors. And each of these colors represents a different song pattern. And if you have different shades of the same color, that's an evolution of the one pattern. So here we had a revolution from blue to red, and then red evolved for a couple of years. Um, and then we're missing a few years because uh, in a few years I didn't have six whales. In, in 2007, I only had one, so I couldn't really um, include that here. But so that's what all these different colors mean. And what I found was that as the songs evolved, they were getting more unique. Now, individuality didn't necessarily drop when a, when a revolution happened, but when the song was evolving slowly, it was consistently getting more and more unique. So what does all of this information tell us about the song and what makes it catchy? Well, what we think is that all of these evolutions and all of these changes to the songs, we think that they're just embellishments. They're, they're becoming more unique as they evolve. Um, but particularly, a more complicated song was not more predictable. So it didn't appear to contain more information than a simple song. Um, and so that's what led us to believe that these were probably um, embellishments. And one, a predictable song is probably going to be easier to learn. Um, most of us can remember nursery rhymes. Not a lot of us can remember Tolstoy. And ultimately, we think that they may be trying to stand out amidst the conformity. And if you think about it, conformity can sometimes be a really good way to figure out who's the best. It's why we have standardized tests. If everybody has to sing the same thing, then you have a better idea of who's singing it the best, which, if this display is reproductive, is probably going to be pretty important. So now I wanted to look at, OK, what are some of the underlying rules? Are there any rules? And when we refer to rules in animal communication, we're talking about something called syntax. So that's the rules that govern how sounds are arranged. Um, another, you might have heard the term syntax to usually mean word selection in, um, in linguistics. But in terms of animal communication, we're talking specifically just about the rules that govern how the sounds are arranged. And usually syntax can be broken down into two main categories that are relevant to animal communication. The first is regular grammar. That's very simple. Most animal communication has regular grammar. And that just means that it's finite. And A has a certain probability of following B. And that's kind of the end of the rules. Context-free grammar, we think, is unique to humans. There have been a couple of studies that have suggested it's present in birdsong. Um, but those studies um, are pretty new, and they're, they're not entirely accepted. So it's still, at the moment, it's still accepted that it's predominantly um, only found in humans. What context-free grammar has is recursive patterns. That means that you can have meaningful sequences embedded in one another. So the cat ran. The cat ran after the mouse. The mouse ran after the cat. Those, all three of those sentences, I, I'm assuming, made sense, even though I changed 
how the, um, how the sequence was arranged, how long the sequence was, because there were sequences within the sentence that you recognized as having a particular meaning, you were able to, to understand the sentence even when I moved around the words. So that's what we mean by context-free grammar. So in Humpback Whale Song, um, it's got predominantly regular grammar, just like most other animal communication. Now, the way I wanted to look at rules in, in the song was by studying network structure. What network structure is, is it's how connected units are. And there's a particular type of network called a small world network that has two main features. Lots of connections, so a high number of connections, and short distances. And the best way to explain this is through, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of something called six degrees of separation. In the States, we call it six degrees to Kevin Bacon, but I was told that maybe you don't call it that here. So six degrees of separation is the idea that any two people in the world can be connected by six or fewer acquaintances. So in this network structure, we are the units and our association with another person are the connections. So for example, you guys have all met me, but none of you have met my mother, my mother who is in Boston, as far away as it's possible to be. But now all of you are connected to my mother through only two steps, you to me, me to her. So if you were to tell me something tonight and then I call my mom and tell her, the information has gone from you to her through only two steps. So that's how a small world network works. It's the idea that no matter how big the network is, because you have lots of connections, um, you end up with these short steps between any two units in that network. So that's how network um, structure works. And I wanted to apply this to Humpback Whale Song. So you see small world networks in a lot of different things. Um, the very particular thing about small world networks is that they um, transfer information very quickly. So as I said, you could tell me something, I tell my mother, and the information has gone from Brisbane, Australia to Boston, Massachusetts in what, um, when I call my mother, whenever that is. So that's really fast. So you find it in a lot of systems. Um, so for example, um, emails, if the connections are between people are uh, email communication, this is, this is essentially how a network of emails, um, how it looks. And so you can see lots of these little clusters, but there's lots of connections between them. So any two units, no matter how far apart they are, wouldn't need very many steps to link them. You also get them in the human brain. And if you think about it, the, the connections in the human brain need to transfer information really fast. So as a result, they have a small world network structure. You get it in semantics, so the meanings of different words. So here, this shows a network of words and the link between the word volcano and the word ache. And it only takes a couple of steps. It goes from volcano to Hawaii to relax to, to soothe to ache. So it's not very many steps to link two seemingly um, unrelated words. And we find it in bird song. So this is an example um, of a network structure of a bird song. And each of these individual circles is a sound, a sound unit. And the thickness of the lines indicate how connected they are. So in sounds, the connection is, are they adjacent to each other in the sequence? Are they next to each other? or are they really far apart? Um, so for example, in English, Q is almost always followed by U. So there would be a very thick line between Q and U because they're very, very often found next to each other. Whereas X is probably gonna be off by itself because nothing ever starts with X or ends with X or uses X really. Um, so that's how you can look at network structure in communication. And because we found it in birdsong, and birdsong is the best analog that we have to whale song, I thought, well, I wonder if whale song has the same structure. Let's look at that. 
So the way we looked at this was through network modeling. And again, I'm not gonna go into this too much because it's very mathy, but I'm happy to talk about it after. But the two main things I'm looking at in order to look at a song's network structure are clustering and path lengths. So clustering measures how, whether or not sounds are adjacent in the sequence, and that tells us how connected they are. So if you have, a, if this shows up, A, B, A, B, if it shows up over and over again, then A and B are highly connected. So that's how we measure connectedness. And path length measures the distance between sounds. So if we have A, B, C, D, E, F, A and C have a short path length. They only have two steps, one, two. A and F have a longer distance because they have five steps between them. So that's how we measure the steps between the sounds or the distance between the sounds. So what you do when you want to determine what kind of network structure something has, particularly if it's got small world structure, is you compare your network to a random version of that network. So you take the same number of units, the same number of connections, but you randomize it. And you look at these two variables that I've talked about, clustering and path length, and you use this very mathy equation to get a small world coefficient. So if your network is random, it's gonna have a small world coefficient of less than one because you don't have a lot of clustering and you're probably gonna have some really long path lengths. But if you have small world structure, you're gonna have a coefficient of greater than one because you're gonna have high numbers of clustering and low path length. So again, I'm happy to talk more about the, the mathiness of it all after, but essentially that's how I looked at small world structure. I compared my whale songs to a random network and I looked at uh, the coefficients. So these are all of the small world coefficients. This big black line is that, that cutoff of S equals one. And what you can see is that every single year's song had small world structure they all had small world coefficients greater than one. And um, I was really, really hoping that the more complex a song was, the higher its small world coefficient would be. And sadly, that is not how science works. When you want something to show up, it very rarely does. But what this told me is that every year's song, no matter what kind of song pattern it was, whether it was simple, complex, songs, songs that were completely unrelated, they all still had this small world structure. So in the world of small world networks, we can now add whale song. So this is uh, one of the networks from one of the years of, um, of my data. And each of these circles, it's basically the same as the bird song one. Each of these circles is a sound unit and there are circles around um, the sounds that had lots of connections. So these sounds all tended to be found next to each other frequently. And the color of the arrows tells you how, how frequently, basically. So then I wanted to see how this compared to birdsong. Um, so I looked at my small world coefficient. Um, I took an average of all the small world coefficient values across my data set, and I compared it to all the different songbird species for which a small world coefficient has been calculated. So all the birds are in blue, humpback whales are in red. And it's wholly unremarkable. It doesn't, it's not a lot higher, it's not a lot lower, it fits right in. And that I think makes a lot of sense because bird song and humpback whale song have a lot of parallels and similarities in their structure. So this was really cool because it meant that bird song and humpback whale song actually have a lot of similarity in how they're structured and some of the rules that they follow. The other thing that I found was a lot of repetitive patterns. And no matter what kind of song pattern I had, I always found kind of alternating, so A, B, A, B, A, B, or doublets or sometimes multiples, three, four repetitions. Sometimes you'd have these big long trains of 10 or 12. And this is, um, kind of equivalent to rhyming. And they've actually described this in Hawaiian song in about the 80s, I think like 83, 
they, they described it, but they could only describe it qualitatively. So qualitatively means um, you can do it descriptively, but you can't quantify it, you can't put numbers on it. So I took uh, a lot of their theories and I put some numbers on it. So this is what we mean by, by these different patterns. So these are two completely different songs, one's from 2008, one's from 2013. And here you see A, B, A, B, A. And down here, completely different sounds, completely different song pattern, and you get kind of X, Y, X, Y, X, Y, X, Y. So you're getting these alternating patterns. So this seemed to be really, really common. Um, you would also get doublets. So 2002, 2012, so these songs are 10 years apart. And again, completely different types of sounds, completely different years, but you're still getting A, 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 B, 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 B. And then in some years you get multiples, three, four, five. And again, you can see how different these sounds are. This is a really kind of short, high frequency one, and this is a longer, lower frequency one. But you're still getting these um, repeating multiple patterns. And then you actually can even get things like this, where if you uh, look closely enough, these are actually all separate sounds, um, but it comes across as, I can't do it, but you know when people roll their R's, like when they're speaking Spanish or something, I've been trying since I was eight and I can't do it, but um, it sounds a bit like that, but when you actually break it down, it's a bunch of different, um, of individual sounds that kind of blend together. Altogether, what does all this mean? What do all these patterns mean? And what ultimately I found is that the complexity of the song changes, the arrangement changes, but the underlying structure isn't changing. You're always getting that small world network structure. You're always getting those repetitive patterns. And having consistent rules is probably one of the reasons that these songs can be learned so quickly and so easily. So the fact that all of these males can essentially learn pretty much a new song every year and learn it in a matter of um, days or weeks and have it spread from West Australia to French Polynesia, having these consistent rules is probably one of the reasons that that can happen. And the fact that they share some of these rules with other species, particularly with birdsong, um, tells us that there might be common rules across species. And that's really exciting because one of the reasons that we study vocal communication, in particular, in particular vocal learning, so how animals learn their communication, um, is because we want to know how we evolved our communication to the degree that we have. So nothing that we have in animals comes close to language. So I want to make that very clear. I've used a lot of similar um, terms, but human language is still um, the furthest, most advanced extreme we have of vocal communication. But this can give us an idea of how we might have been able to evolve our language. So what are the underlying rules that allowed our language to develop to the point that it has? And that's why it's so exciting that we were seeing similarities between whale song and bird song, um, because you also see small world structure in, um, in human language. That's why you see it in semantics and things like that. So having these commonalities is really exciting. To bring it all back, what actually makes a hit whale song? And there are a couple of things that we've figured out. One, either complexity and or novelty. So we saw that the complexity of the song is changing. As it evolves, it gets more and more complex. And then when revolution happens, that complexity drops. And so we're not sure if the whales just, it gets so complicated that they just go, you know what, I can't, I, I can't. We have to start over again, give me a new one. Um, it's like when the song on the radio changes and you go, oh, finally. Um, so it might be that that's happening. It's just getting too complicated and they can't learn it. It gets too difficult. They have to start over. Or it's possible that the novelty of a new song is what's sexy. So it might be that all the other males are making small little additions to the song and it's getting more and more complicated. And then one guy goes, yeah, you guys, you guys keep adding embellishments to the old song, but I'm so smart that I can learn an entirely new song. And so we're not sure whether the complexity or the novelty 
is which one is, is the sexier thing. And so that's something that we're investigating now. The second aspect of a hit whale song is predictability. So having predictable arrangements, it means it's easy to learn, it's easy to remember. And that's obviously really important because it, they have to learn these songs really, really fast. Having structure that facilitates that predictability and facilitates that learning. So having the small world network structure, I think is one of the reasons that the song can be learned easily because um, it's a structure that facilitates learning. So that's what we think. And one of the things I'm really hoping to find out is if we were to look at the, the social network of whales, I think that we would find that it follows a small world structure as well. But that is a much bigger project for much further in the future when I have a lot more money. And then the final thing is these repetitive patterns, these rhyming schemes. Um, and we reckon that that's the reason that, that they can remember these songs even when they get complicated because they know that there's gonna be certain things that stay the same. There are gonna be alternating patterns, there's gonna be doublets, there's gonna be um, multiple repetitions and knowing that's gonna be there is gonna make it easier to learn. So that is in essence what I think makes a hit whale song. So um, I have to acknowledge all my co-authors, um, my supervisors, Mike um, Node, Ellen Garland, who's at the University of St. Andrews, and Rebecca Dunlop, as well as um, all the funding bodies that allowed me to spend four years listening to whale song. Um, so I'm happy to take questions. And thank you for listening. All right. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, we will take some questions now. So if you have some burning whale or other marine science questions, now's your chance to either tweet or write them down on some paper. And um, we will come around and collect those, give you a chance, chance to catch your breath. <laughs> Um, next month, next month, Briz Science is back, and we are on at the 10th of June, and we are talking about algae. So everything from creating food from algae, including delicious caviar, vegan caviar, through to solar power. So don't miss that. Feel free to write down any algae puns you want me to use next month. Um, a little bit short on those. And we can work through that. Great. Okay. Okay. Wow. We've got a lot of questions tonight. Um, so let's go to Twitter first, where we have um, Nicola asks, "Can whales be taught a human remixed song?" Ooh. Um, so there have been the way to answer that question, which, quite frankly, we we don't know the answer to at the moment. But the way to answer that would be with what we call playbacks. So there have been a few instances where scientists have, you basically put a speaker in the water, play something at the whales and see how they respond. Um, and one of the first researchers that really pioneered this field is a guy called Peter Tyak. And in 1982, when there were less rules, he went to Hawaii and they tried to play just another whale song um, and the whale charged at the boat. So, um, I would suspect that they probably can't learn a human song um, just because of the, the nature of human, human song is, is gonna be complicated in a very different way. And also just how we form sound and how they form sound are so drastically different. But um, it might be possible to learn maybe a melody. Uh, but I, I don't know, I think it would be um, something that is probably far in the future, but the way you would find that out is by um, maybe making a, a very simplified version of a human song and then playing it back at them and see if they charge the boat or if they, um, if they change their song and, and maybe pick it up. Great. Um, we've got a couple of questions here uh, that are, do whale songs interact with other species songs? Um, or in, with other species in general? Do other species interact? With um, so we do have, there are a couple of other species that, other whale species that sing. So you get bowheads, um, bowhead whales sing, um, blue whales sing, but they're a very different kind of song. And we don't, we, we've never really noticed a, a very particular reaction across species. 
Um, so I, I think that they'll probably react to the whale song the way they'd react to just any noise in their environment. I think across species, it's probably just, um, just noise to, to other species. How far do whale songs travel? Um, the lower frequency sounds can go really far. Um, most of the time you can't, at least we wouldn't be able to hear a song more than 10 or 20 kilometers away. But blue whale songs, because blue whales, their song is almost entirely very low frequency and that can go thousands of um, kilometers. Wow. It can travel really, really far. Um, we probably wouldn't be able to pick it up. So it's possible that, that humpback whales can hear um, the, song, the song further away than we can. Um, but that was something that I expected when we started looking at the song between two different populations. I thought that we'd get similarities in the low frequency sounds that travel really far and differences in the high frequency sounds. Um, and that's not what we found at all. Um, but yeah, so it depends on the frequency of the sound. The lower ones are gonna travel a lot further. Okay. Um, Anne on Twitter, and this might be out of your wheelhouse, but asks, what effect does seismic testing have on whales and their songs? <laughs> you, you'd have to ask um, my supervisors, Mike and Beck, they'll have a better, <laughs> they'll have a better idea. Um, but what I think we've found generally is that um, a lot of the time they'll, they'll at least temporarily stop singing, but we, we have also heard them um, during my PhD, they were finishing up a, a big project called Brass, and that's where they were looking at the seismic, um, kind of the seismic air guns and what influence that had on the whale's behavior and the song. And you get some whales that would sing straight through and um, didn't miss a beat, and others would sometimes um, stop singing for a while. So it didn't uh, it didn't affect the pattern of the song at all, but it more affected. Um, sometimes when they were singing or um, how long they would sing for. Okay, we have, I've got like half a dozen questions which all want to know, um, who are these, the great songwriters amongst the whales? So, Andrew wants to know, um, what's the usual age of the, on Twitter, age, what's the usual age of whales who create new songs? Are younger whales tend to do the revolution? Um, Peter wants to know, does the evolution proceed through the social structure of the community? Um, do the younger whales create new songs? Who's there? Um, so that's actually a project that um, Ellen Garland, who was one of my supervisors, and she's at the University of St. Andrews now, um, that's pretty much exactly what her big project is trying to find out, and I'm, and I'm a, a small part of that really big project. So at the moment, um, we, don't, we don't really know who's leading the charge in these changes, but that's one of the things that, that we're trying to find out. In New Caledonia, which is where the song goes after East Australia, it goes to New Caledonia, and um, that population is a lot smaller, and Claire Gallig, who um, has been collecting data there for about 20 years, she has recordings of the same whales in different years. And so that's exactly the data that you need to answer that question. So we're gonna try and look at um, the same whale singing in different years to find out, are some of them at the forefront? Are some of them uh, a bit daft and lagging behind? Um, but it doesn't really, age isn't really a concern in terms of um, learning the song in the sense that everybody has to learn a new song every year. So once they, once they hit kind of breeding, matur like maturity, sexual maturity, which is usually around five, um, but that's sort of like saying an 18 year old is an adult. It doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna start breeding at five. Um, so we're not quite sure when they start singing, but then they all have to learn the new song every year. And what we're gonna try to find out with this data in New Caledonia is are the younger ones, can they pick up the song a bit quicker or are there specific individuals that lead the charge? Um, so that's the, that's the question we're trying to answer right at this moment, so watch that space. The ones that rebel against their parents, you know, yeah. don't like that old fashioned music. Well, every but... once in a while we'll get what's called an aberrant song, which is a song that's completely different to the normal song. So everybody sings their song a little, the same song a little bit differently, but every so often you'll just get somebody who 
kicks the door in and is singing the Sex Pistols instead of Celine Dion. And that's called an aberrant song. And so that would be a really interesting question is, you know, do you get the same individuals that tend to do the aberrant song? And um, how lucky in love are they if they're singing an aberrant song? <laughs> <laughs> um, fantastic. Um, two more questions. We're almost out of time. One is from Mal, who asks, have you analysed an ACDC song for comparison? <laughs> um, I could. I haven't, but, I, but you definitely could. You just have to... And the nice thing about Human Song is it's already in... You already have an alphanumeric uh, representation of the song, so you'd really just have to throw it into the, into the network modelling and get a get a number, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't be that hard, actually. There you go, PhD project for someone. <laughs> um, actually, I'm going to ask two more. So David on Twitter just asks, have you been able to identify any information content in the songs that might matter? Are they meaningless pop songs or Dylan? Um, <laughs> Dylan. Ed Sheeran or Dylan? Um, so what we have, what we kind of have started to identify is... Um, one of the, the researchers that, that came through the lab uh, just before me found that there seemed to be some information in different parts of the song. So she proposed um, what we call a multimodal song. So she thinks that some parts of the song indicate basically just, I'm a male humpback whale and, that's, and I would like to mate. And there are other aspects of the song that would suggest you know, I am Bob the male humpback whale, and I am 15 years old, and I would really like to mate with you specifically. Um, but we, at the moment, it's difficult to corroborate that because all of our data is observational. So it's been um, postulated because there are other species like frogs, for instance, there are certain parts of their calls and their songs that indicate um, specific information such as age or size. And if you think about it, you know, th things like your, your vocal pitch and my vocal pitch indicate our respective genders. Um, so we, we think that there's likely that kind of base information content, but that's something else that, um, that Mike and Beck are trying to look at now with one of their students is, um, you know, is it indicating anything specific about the individual? So that's what they're actually trying to find out right now. So a lot of these questions are in the process of being answered. Well, it's it, it really exciting, and I think it's fantastic to see a, the overlap of mathematics and biology in yet another way, you know, these skills that yeah. are cross-disciplinary skills and the interesting research that's coming it's, out of um, that. My partner is an engineer, and he always tells people, I do so much more math than he does. <laughs> um, and it's very, a lot of people don't realize how much math actually often goes into biology. Um, it's statistical modeling and just lots and lots of math. So if you want to be a marine biologist, um, learn to love math. <laughs> and you can see some past Bridge Science <laughs> talks that follow up on that theme. Um, on that note, I'm going to uh, close proceedings. Please thank our wonderful speaker, Dr. Jenny <laughs> Allen, UQ and Griffith. Fantastic talk. Oh, oh goodness. And we'll see you all next month, but please join us in food and drink outside. <laughs>